where we're going to talk about our series on angels and demons because this is week four. The first sermon was an introduction to the series. The second sermon was about angels. And last week's sermon was the start on our study on the subject of demons. Now, as I told you last week, to really understand demons and what they are, we have to go back to the Old Testament and study the fall. Because the story of Noah's Ark and the flood holds the key to understanding what demons are and their origin. And we're going to have to go more in depth than we normally do on a Sunday morning. I'll be honest with you, normally on a Sunday morning, I keep it kind of general. Some of you think I go pretty deep. I really don't. If you like in-depth teaching, then you need to come on a Wednesday night. But in this series, we have to go more in depth than we normally do. Now, last week, we covered the first two verses in Genesis chapter 6. And to be honest with you, I thought I could cover all four verses, but I wasn't able to do that because of time. So we're actually going to finish up this section kind of interesting some of you think wow he just covered two verses last week I'll be honest with you on Wednesday nights there have been times I've spent four weeks on one verse but anyways I thought I did pretty good last week but I wasn't able to cover all four verses so we're going to actually cover verses three and four this morning but let's keep it in context so if you would turn with me to Genesis chapter six and let's read the first four verses follow along with me as I read it Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, gorgeous, knockouts and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now this has got to be one of the most interesting passages of Scripture in the entire Bible, but it's also one of the most controversial. Now up into the 3rd century AD, there was no controversy. Everyone believed that the phrase, the sons of God, referred to angels because they followed sound hermeneutical principles to interpret this passage of Scripture. You see, one of the fundamental principles of hermeneutics is that Scripture interprets Scripture, which means if you're studying an obscure verse, you need to look at it in the context of other verses. You don't just study it outside of the other verses. Or if you have an unusual phrase or an unusual word in a verse you're studying, you need to look at how that word is used in other verses to determine its meaning. Does that make sense? Everyone with me? That's probably the number one rule of hermeneutics. Everyone knows what hermeneutics is, right? It's a science and art of how to interpret the scriptures properly. But anyways, now the phrase sons of God is used only five times in the Old Testament. Once here in Genesis chapter 6 verse 2, three times in the book of Job, and once in the book of Daniel. And every time it's used in the Old Testament, it refers to angels. Every time. No exceptions. So if we follow sound hermeneutical principles, we have to conclude that the phrase sons of God refers to angels. In this case, it refers to fallen angels because angels were never created to marry or to have sex. So for an angel to do this, they had to rebel against God. And the only ones that would have done this are the ones who had already rebelled. The angels that had followed Lucifer when he rebelled. So what this passage of scripture is saying is that the sons of God, which are fallen angels, noticed how beautiful the daughters of men were, and they had sex with them, producing a hybrid race. And that was the accepted interpretation of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, until the 3rd century AD when Julius Africanus came on the scene. You see, the idea that angels could manifest themselves in our world and have sex with mortal women seemed far-fetched to him. So he came up with an alternative theory, an alternative interpretation. He totally disregarded hermeneutical principles, and he proposed the theory that the sons of God were the descendants of Seth, and the daughters of men were the descendants of Cain. Seth represents the godly line and Cain represents the ungodly line. So the godly descendants of Seth married the ungodly descendants of Cain and that was their sin. And that's why God caused the flood. That's why he judged the world. Now people, that's ridiculous. But now you know where the theory comes from. It comes from Julius Africanus. In fact, 
I like you to check me out. And if you want to check me out so you don't just think that I'm making this stuff up, go to a library. You'll find a 38-volume set on the early church fathers. In the sixth volume, which is the anti Nicene Fathers, which means it was before the Nicene Creed, you'll find in volume 6, page 131, what it has to say about Julius Africanus. He is the first one who proposed this alternative theory in the year around 260 A.D., always before that. And we're talking about the Jews all the way back to the first temple period taught that the sons of God were angels. But he thought that was too far-fetched. So let me read what he says. He says, when men multiplied on the earth, the angels of heaven came together with the daughters of men. In some copies, I found the sons of God. In other words, in some of the copies, it was translated as angels. In some of the copies, it was translated as sons of God. Then he goes further. What is meant by the Spirit? Okay, we're not going to stick with literal interpretation. We're going to say this is what the Spirit meant. We're going to make this allegorical. What is meant by the Spirit in my opinion? Why does he say in my opinion? Because no one had ever proposed this. The early church, the Old Testament Jews, everyone interpreted the way that I'm interpreting it. But in his opinion, he says... What is meant by the Spirit, in my opinion, is that the descendants of Seth are called the sons of God on account of the righteous men and patriarchs who have sprung from him, even down to the Savior himself. But that the descendants of Cain are named the seed of men as have nothing divine in them on account of the wickedness of their race and the inequality of their nature being a mixed people. Now you can continue reading that, but basically he's a racist. And what he says is they didn't stick with their own race of people and they kind of joined with others, became mongrels, and this is what this is talking about, and God was against them mixing. But now you know where that theory comes from. It comes from Sextus Julius Africanus. But it wasn't until Augustine that, the, that this became the prevalent view or interpretation, if you will. Now, once Augustine accepted this theory that the sons of God refers to Seth's descendants, it became the standard interpretation of the Catholic Church. And many Protestants accepted this interpretation as well because Augustine in Protestant circles was a hero. How many of you know that Calvinism did not come from John Calvin? Calvinism actually came from Augustine. Augustine was John Calvin's hero, and so he actually took what Augustine taught about it, and he developed it in the Christian Institutes. So it bears his name, but actually traces all the way back to Augustine. And you wouldn't believe today how many people think that, oh my gosh, he was wonderful. You ought to go back and read some of the things that Augustine wrote. But anyways, I'm getting off here. What you need to understand is, once Augustine accepted Julius Africanus' theory, then it seems like the Catholic Church has followed suit, And then a lot of the Protestants did too because Augustine was a hero. In fact, it's about 50-50 today in Protestant circles. Some believe that the phrase sons of God refers to Seth's descendants. And some believe that it refers to angels or fallen angels. Now, to me, it's a no-brainer. You either apply true hermeneutical principles and you allow God's word to interpret itself. Or you ignore hermeneutical principles and you come up with your own theory which has no biblical basis. This is what Julius Africanus did. But people, I can't do that. I believe the Bible. And I believe that if you want to interpret it literally, then you have to follow hermeneutical principles and allow the Bible to interpret itself. So I can't do that. I can't tell you, well, my opinion is because I don't believe in the supernatural. That's literally how liberals are. So I'm convinced that the phrase, sons of God, refers to angels. No ifs, ands, or buts. And these angels left their natural habitation and they had sex with mortal women which created a super race of people known as the Nephilim which we're going to talk about when we get to verse 4. But first let's look at verse number 3. So turn with me if you would to verse 3, Genesis chapter 6. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, I want you to underline the word strive. It says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. Now, the word strive is translated from the Hebrew word dune, and it can mean one of two things. It can mean, number one, to judge, or it can mean, number two, to plead with. In this context, it means to plead with. So what God is saying in this verse is that his spirit won't continue to plead with man to repent forever. 
In other words, there's a limit as to how far God will go. And so after warning them, he gave man a deadline. They had 120 years to get their act together. Man had 120 years to repent before he brought judgment upon the earth. 120 years before the flood occurred. So now we have a timetable. Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. We know that because of Genesis chapter 7, verse number 6. It specifically tells us that. So most theologians believe, and I do as well, that Noah was 480 when God informed him that he was going to destroy every living thing upon the earth, with the exception of Noah's family and also the animals that he took with him upon the ark. But there was a 120-year grace period for men to repent. And of course, they didn't repent. So the flood came and it wiped them all out. Now let's look at verse number four. Just follow along with me as I read this. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were men of old, men of renown. Now, I want you to underline the word giants. It says there were giants on the earth. The word giants is translated from the Hebrew word nephil. Now, actually, that's singular, so it's plural here. So it's actually the Hebrew word nephilim. Now, nephil means fallen one, fallen one. The plural of nephil is nephilim, and it means fallen ones. So nephil is singular, nephilim is plural. In other words, there's more than one. Now let me explain the etymology of the word nephil so you'll understand what it means when it says fallen ones. Nephil is derived from the verb nephal, which means to fall. It rhymes so it's easy to remember. Nephal means to fall. So a nephil is one who has fallen, hence the name fallen ones. Nephilim. Now, verse 4 tells us that the Nephilim were the offspring of fallen angels and mortal women. In other words, they were half angel, half man. In fact, if you want to get technical, they were half fallen angel, half man. Look at verse 4 again. There were giants, the Hebrew word Nephilim. There were Nephilim on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them now people I can't make it any clearer than that either you believe the Bible or you don't if you don't believe the Bible if that's something that's beyond uh, your ability to to understand or your ability to to believe then you're a liberal and that's what liberals are in theology they don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in the spiritual. Everything has a natural cause behind them. So when they study the Bible, they don't allow the Bible to interpret itself. They have to come up with theories to make sense of it. And everything is allegorical. But I'll be honest with you. There were no liberals with Old Testament Jews. There were no liberals at the time of Jesus except for the Sadducees. They were kind of the start of the liberals. But in the early church, there were no liberals. They allowed the Bible to interpret itself. So I can't make it any clearer than that. There were giants or Nephilim on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Now look at the last part of verse number four. Let's read that. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Now, I want you to underline the phrase mighty men. Mighty men is translated from the Hebrew word gibor, and it literally means heroes. In fact, notice how the NIV translates this verse. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. See, the NIV is taking it literally. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old. What do they mean of old? Of the old world, the world before the flood. So they were the heroes of old, the old world. Men of renown. Now what this is implying is that these Nephilim were superior creatures physically. They truly were giants, and I'll explain how we know that in a little bit. But because they were half angel and half man, they were bigger, stronger, quicker, faster, and more agile than mortal men. And more wicked because they were half 
fallen angel. And that explains why a person who's possessed by demons has supernatural strength. Those demons, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, and I don't want to do that. That's next week, so let's keep reading. Look back at verse 4, and I want you to notice the clause, and also afterward in the middle of the verse. Here's what it says. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards. Do you see that clause? Now that clause should be placed at the end of the sentence, not where it is. Yeah. You see, when you're translating it, you can either translate this and place it at the beginning of this verse or close to the beginning, or you can place it at the end of the verse. And it should have been placed at the end of the sentence. But before I explain why, let me explain why it's placed where it was. First of all, placing it towards the beginning of the verse seems to be the logical place when you translate the verse from the original Hebrew and you don't take the Bible literally. In other words, you don't believe in the supernatural. But different manuscripts have placed it closer to the end. In fact, the most trusted manuscripts place it at the end of the verse. Secondly, when the Israelites came into the promised land, we're told that there were giants living there. And they refer to those giants as Nephilim. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 33. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. And as you're turning there, let me kind of tell you what Numbers 13 is all about. Moses wrote the first four books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, actually the first five. Deuteronomy, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Now, Moses is writing this, and when you get to Numbers... He's kind of numbering the children of Israel, but he's also talking about coming to the promised land. So they're getting ready to go into the promised land, and they send these spies out. Well, these spies go in, and they see what a wonderful land it is that God is giving them. But then they notice that there's some giants there. And this is what is written. Now that you know it, let's let's read verse number 33, Numbers chapter 13. Here's what it says. There we saw the giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now the word giants is translated from the Hebrew word Nephilim. So it appears as if the Nephilim survived the flood. And that's why in Genesis chapter 6 verse number 4. The people who were translating it. Even though the better manuscripts placed it at the end of the sentence. They decided not to do that. They placed it where they did at the start or the beginning of the verse. And the reason they did that was to give the impression that some of the Nephilim survived the flood. And that's why there were giants in the promised land at the time of Moses, at the time of Joshua. When they went in to to, to, uh, scout the land or to spy on the land, they came back and they said, guess what? There's Nephilim in there. Yeah. Now, let me explain Why I believe that that clause should have been placed at the end of the sentence. In other words, like this. Look at the screen. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. And also afterward. Can you see how this totally changes the meaning? It's telling us that the Nephilim were heroes before the flood. Because they were giants And they became legends after the flood. In other words, they were men of renown in their own time, but they became legends after the flood. That's what this clause is saying when it's placed at the end of the verse. Look at that verse again and you'll see what I'm saying. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. When the sons of God, which are angels, went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown, And also afterwards. In other words, they were heroes and men of renown after the flood. After the flood, they became legends. So why did they refer to the sons of Anak as Nephilim in the book of Numbers? Does anyone know why? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because after the flood, the word Nephilim became a figure of speech. The sons of Anak were giants. They were tall Nine feet, ten feet tall. I mean, think about this. David and Goliath. Goliath was huge. And guess what they would have referred to him as? A Nephilim. Because that's a figure of speech. That's why they referred to him as that. Because they were huge. 
And the Nephilim were legends. They were myths. And all of them were superior physically. They were bigger. They were faster. They were quicker. They were more agile. And they were heroes. And after the flood, they became legends. So that word Nephilim became a figure of speech after the flood, referring to anyone that was bigger, faster, quicker. We know that because the flood destroyed every man, woman, and child, including the offspring of the fallen angels and mortal women. Listen to me. No one, including the Nephilim, survived the flood with the exception of Noah's family. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse number 7, and I will prove it to you. Prove it to you. Notice what it says. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. In other words, every human on the face of the earth, I'm going to wipe out. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Alan, this is every human. We know that Nephilim were half angel, half man. So maybe this isn't referring to them. Well, let's keep reading. Notice what it says. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing. I will destroy every living thing. Not most of the living things, not some of the living things, not the majority of the living things. I will destroy every living thing. Then he goes further. All the people, and they were considered to be a hybrid race, but they would have been considered people. All the people, the large animals, in case you think they're an animal now, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. Why even the birds of the sky? Because Genesis tells us this flood even, co even uh, covered the highest peak of the tallest mountain on the earth. So there was no land for the birds to actually come down and be able to rest. And because the flood took so long to get to the top before it began to recede, the birds became exhausted and they fell into the water and they drowned. God destroyed every living creature. But, but, Stories about the Nephilim did survive the flood. People didn't survive, but stories about the Nephilim did. And that's what Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 is saying. And that's also why mythological stories from every corner of the world are so similar. If you study mythology, you'll find that they all tell similar stories of gods with a little g having sex with human women and producing offspring that became heroes, men of renown, legends, as an example. Hercules was the offspring of Zeus in a human world, in a human, human world, human woman. Perseus was the offspring of Zeus in a mortal woman. Baldor was the offspring of Odin, the Norse god in a human woman, Frigga. Romulus and Remus, how many of you know who Romulus and Remus were? They were the twins that founded Rome, right? Yeah, you knew that, right? They were the offspring of the god Mars and the human woman Rhea Silvia. That also explain, explains why their gods were so promiscuous and evil. When you study mythology, man, let me tell you something. Their gods were very promiscuous and very evil, and that explains it. You see, the stories of the Nephilim that existed before the flood were passed on by Noah's son after the flood. And that's why you have common roots in these mythological stories from every corner of the world. Just think about it. Let's suppose that it was just me and Lisa that survived the flood along with my two daughters and their husbands. So it wouldn't be Noah. It would be Alan and his wife, Lisa, and their two daughters and their husbands. And God warned me and told me that he was going to bring judgment in 120 years and what to do, and I built this ark. Now, after we survive and we come upon this earth and it begins to sprout out again and these animals go out and they begin to repopulate, I have grandchildren. And they begin to ask, why are we the only ones on the earth? And I say, because the world was wicked and the world was evil and God brought judgment upon it and there was a great flood. But God warned us and he told us how to build an ark. And we built this ark. It took 120 years. 
And after we built this ark, God sent these animals two by two, male and female, and we boarded this ark, and he told us how much food to take. And we were there, and this flood came, and it wiped out everyone, and then we descended on dry ground, and we are here to repopulate the earth. Well, Grandpa, what was it like before the flood? Oh, it was wicked. What do you mean by wicked? Well, you need to understand that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were very beautiful. And they came down and they had sex with them. They took them. And we remember what that means last week. And they had children. What were their children like? Well, let me tell you some stories. One was by the name of Hercules. And they start telling this. Well, pretty soon it becomes, as you see, these gods, little g, because they're fallen angels. You've got to remember, these were angels that were created to be in the spiritual world, but they can manifest in the physical. They're superior physically. They're bigger, they're taller, they're faster, they're quicker. And they're good-looking because God creates good-looking things. But they're fallen angels, and they have sex, and they produce this hybrid race. So I start telling my grandchildren about them. And guess what? Pretty soon, as they have grandchildren, these stories are passed down. And now, all of a sudden, you see these common myths in every culture. In fact, there is a whole field of study called comparative mythology. How many of you have ever taken a comparative mythology class? Well, if you ever get a chance, take one by a Christian. Because it will be one of the most interesting classes you ever take. Let me explain what comparative mythology is. In fact, if you were looking in a college textbook or a a college syllabus and they were explaining what the class is all about, this is how it would define it. Comparative mythology is the comparison of myths from different cultures in an attempt to identify the similarities and the common origin. In other words, you study all of this, these mythologies from different cultures, and why you do that is because you want to see how similar they are. And then when you see how similar they are, you want to see if you can find a common origin. Yeah, that's what comparative mythology is. And what they found is that almost every culture has a myth about a universal flood where only one family survived. Now, I have several books on mythology because I took some mythology classes, enjoyed it. But here is the Dictionary of Mythology. If you would like to look this up, feel free to do this. On page 379, it's talking about the flood. And it's talking about all the different cultures that have this myth that there was a worldwide flood and only one family survived. Now, this is what it says. I'm at that age where I need reading glasses. When I bring notes up, size 18 font for me to read with that glass. But anyways, many cultures have myths relating to the flood or the deluge sent to eliminate the human race, usually with an advance warning to enable a few to survive to repopulate the earth. And then it begins to show you, and it gives you a few of the people or cultures that believed in this and passed this down. You had the Australians with the Aborigines, Central America with the Aztecs, you had the Mayans, you have Mexican tribes, and they go in and talk about the Hokamata, the Pukima, all the different ones. But anyways, and China, the Chinese believed in that. It was the thunder god trapped by their father, Nuka, and he goes in and talks about it. Egyptians, when Ray, tired of man's muttering against him, and it tells what he did with the flood. In Greek, Prometheus built an ark and survived with his wife, Pura. Hindus, the god Vishnu. Irish, yes, Sisar was Noah's granddaughter, and he talks about she was refused to place, be placed in the ark, but it goes on. Korean, Lithuanian, Mesopotamian, New Zealand, North America. In fact, a lot of our tribes in North America, the Algonquin, if you're from that tribe, forgive me for the way I pronounced it, the Caddo, the Inuit, the Papago, the Paima, the Sioux have a story about it. The Skagit and more tribes, you can keep looking at it. Pacific Islands, the Bank Islands, the Fiji Islands, the Hawaiian Islands, Siberia. South America, you have the tribes of the Ocaranians, the Arawaks, uh, the Chipcha Indians, the Incas, the Kaira, and you continue on. talks about the Taiwanese, the Thai. All of these different cultures have this one common story. Whatever their god was, 
They brought judgment upon the world. There was this great flood and only one family survived. Yeah. Yeah. And almost every culture has myths involving gods with the little g, sleeping with mortal women, and producing children that were half God and half human. Now, we know that they weren't gods. What were they? Fallen angels. But when the story goes, I mean, they're talking about these spiritual beings that lived in the spiritual world, but they could manifest themselves in this physical world, and they had sex with human women, and they produced this hybrid race of people that were superior in size, speed, agility, and all of these different characteristics that we value. And they became legends. And because of these similarities, most professors who are Christians that teach comparative mythology believe that they all share a common origin. And you want to know what that origin is? Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Now, next week, I'm going to reveal what demons are and their origin and what they have to do with the Nephilim. The reason we had to spend two weeks going through the flood, Genesis chapter 6, the first four verses, is because when I explain what demons are, you wouldn't understand if we didn't spend these two weeks. And when I talk about their origin, you'd have no idea what I was talking about. And I'll also show you what Jesus had to say about demons. In fact, we get much of our theology on demons from Jesus. Because Jesus had a lot to say about demons. And we're going to look at what he had to say about demons. We're also going to look, about, look at what Jews believed demons were at the time of Jesus. That's going to blow your mind. Because Jesus doesn't contradict it. In fact, he supports it. Plus, we're going to talk about what demons do. And how they affect us and the world around us. Because there are demons here today. As we were talking about angels, I told you if you had the supernatural ability to look into that other dimension, the spiritual world, you would see angels all around us in this room. But let me tell you what else you would see. You would see demons. Yeah. It's usually when I get ready to say, let's stand, and everyone rushes out. Those are demons. I'm just just... <laughs> no one's leaving now when I say, please stand, are you? But that's next week. You don't want to miss next week. In fact, I would invite as many people as you can because they're going to enjoy it. And then they're going to ask you questions like, well, who were the Nephilim? Well, what did he mean when he said this? And you're going to be able to explain it. And you're going to seem like this Bible scholar. 